Thanks by a uh, show of hands. How many of you have uh, signed up for the Hebrew classes? Can you raise your hands? I know there's a lot more. We've got about 30 people at least that have signed up. But anyway, as you've heard, the classes will begin on Saturday, <coughs> July the 12th. And once again, please fill in the sign-up sheet in the foyer. And over the years here at the Tabernacle, I am very, very grateful for a congregation that understands the importance of the Hebrew language. Because after all, it's the language of the Bible. Somebody say amen. amen. It's the language of heaven. It's the language that God used when he spoke forth creation and mankind, meaning us. Did you know that our very existence is embodied in the Hebrew language? It's also the language of Israel, and Israel is our spiritual homeland. How many of you have been grafted into the olive tree of Israel? How many of you realize that you share in the commonwealth of Israel, fellow citizens with the Jewish people? According to Romans 11 and Ephesians chapter 2. And also Hebrew is the language of our Messiah. I can assure you, when Yeshua was a little boy, his mother didn't say to him, Jesus, will you please take out the trash? She called him by his name, which is Yeshua. Everybody say, it's all about Yeshua. So Hebrew is the language of our Messiah. Yeshua himself is the Aleph and the Tav, meaning he is the first and the last letters of the Hebrew Aleph Bet. We know that he is the spoken word. When God spoke creation into existence, the word that rolled off of the mouth of God is the spoken word. Yeshua is the spoken word. And that spoken word became the written word recorded in the Torah by Moses. And the written word became the living word in the person of Yeshua of Nazareth. Yeshua is the Torah made flesh. And also, how many of you discovered that the more that you read the Bible, the whole Bible, the more you see Yeshua in it? Hallelujah. Now in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, the Messiah said, not one jot or tittle of the Torah will pass away until all is accomplished. You know that every jot and tittle of the Torah is the actual spiritual DNA of the Messiah himself. And when he says jot, that represents the Hebrew letter Yud, which is the smallest of the Hebrew letters. And when he says tittle, it is actually the smallest part of a Hebrew letter. It's a tiny little stroke that can change one letter to another. Now the Hebrew language is called in Hebrew, Ivrit. Everyone say Ivrit. 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 And it is a language of action. It has an emphasis on verbs rather than nouns. And the word Ivrit actually comes from the root Hebrew word Avar, which means to cross over or to pass through, again requiring action. And one who is a Hebrew is pronounced in Hebrew Ivri. Everybody say Ivri. Ivri. And plural would be Ivrim. Everyone? Ivrim. Ivrim, who are people of action, people of obedience, people who are not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. That is reflected by the Hebrew word Shema. Shema doesn't just mean to hear, it means to hear and obey. You can't separate the two. If God says to do it, you do it. Amen. Now, Avinu Abraham, our father Abraham, who is the first Ivri, is actually referred to as a Hebrew in Genesis 14, verse 13. There was some uh, thinking that Isaac was the first uh, Hebrew, but that's not true. Abraham is the father of all the Jewish people. He is the first Ivri. And of course we know that he was called out. Everybody say called out. He was called out of his father's house, which was a house of idolatry. 
and he crossed over geographical and spiritual boundaries to follow the one true God, the God of Israel, who would lead him to the promised land, to the land that he was going to show him. And as sons and daughters of Abraham, which we are through the Messiah, we are all Evreen with the same calling on our lives as our father Abraham had, meaning to leave a former life of idolatry and to follow and have faith in the one true God, the God of Israel. The God of Israel who leads us to the promised land, if you will, meaning the kingdom of heaven through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And it's also interesting that in the Brit HaRashah, meaning the New Covenant, it refers to the body of Messiah or believers in Yeshua using the Greek word ekklesia, ekklesia, which means called out ones, like Abraham. Now we're all aware of Israeli Independence Day, Yom Ha'etz Ma'ut in Hebrew, which took place on May 15, 1948 when by a miracle Israel was restored as a nation back in her own land once again after 2,000 years of worldwide dispersion. Now in connection with Israel being back in the land, the Hebrew language which was lost was miraculously restored as well. By an individual whose name is Eliezer ben Yehuda who is known as the father of modern Hebrew, completed the restoration uh, of the Hebrew language in the early 20th century, which when you think about it, is just a few decades before Yom HaEitz Ma'ud. See, God had a plan. The restoration of the Hebrew language not only was part of Israel being restored as a nation, but the restoration of the Hebrew language is part of God's latter-day plan for all of us, whether Jew or Gentile. And God is restoring all of us who are in the Messiah, how many of you are in the Messiah, hallelujah, to the pure language of Ivrit, or Hebrew. Now, if you have your Bibles, I trust that you do turn, please, to Zephaniah chapter 3. And Zephaniah is between Habakkuk and Haggai. I know it takes a little time for you to find it. I'll give you a little time. Time's up. <laughs> Zephaniah chapter 3. And we're going to read verse 9. And this is a, actually a latter-day prophecy. For then I will restore to the peoples, underline peoples, a pure language. Now often when we have seen uh, the word peoples or those from the nations, it uses the word goyim, but not here. It uses the word amim for peoples, which is actually used in the Bible interchangeably for the people of Israel and for the people of the nations in the scriptures. That they may all call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. And one accord there literally means shoulder to shoulder, and that is brought out by the Hebrew word shechem that's used here, meaning shoulder to shoulder. And it's actually compared to oxen pulling the yoke together. We're going to look at that a little bit more in a moment. And again, this scripture is an end-time, latter-day prophecy connected with the Messianic Age, similar to other end-time prophecies that we are familiar with, such as Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. In the latter days, many nations will flow to the house of the Lord, saying, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, he will teach us his ways, for the Torah will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Another one in like manner would be from Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23, which says, In the last days, ten men from every language of the nations will grab the tzitzit, meaning the fringes of a talit, which represents the Torah, 
who grabbed the seat seat of a Jewish man saying, let us go with you for we have heard that God is with you. And so part of God's restoration of the church, again in, in the original Greek, ecclesia, part of God's restoration of the body of the Messiah, which was torn from its Jewish roots, I believe includes a return to the Hebrew language. It is an anointed language. It is anointed speech. And if you're grafted in, how many of you are grafted in again to the house of Israel? If you're grafted into the olive tree of Israel, you need some knowledge of Hebrew, which is the language of Israel. Makes sense. And if you're part of the commonwealth of Israel, you need some knowledge of Hebrew, which is the language of Israel. If your lives are hidden in the Messiah, you need some knowledge of the language that he spoke. How many of you want to be more and more like Yeshua? Hallelujah. We often quote the scripture. In him we live and move and have our being. And earlier we saw that during creation, our very existence is embodied in the Hebrew language. It's through the Hebrew language that we live and we move and we have our being. Therefore, it would behoove us to get in touch with the very language that created us. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. And in one way or another, it all comes back to Yeshua, who was the Aleph and the Tav. Now, I realize that our congregation, along with many, many other Messianic congregations are quite familiar with some common biblical Hebrew phrases. So this is a test. How do you say in Hebrew, Jesus the Messiah? Let's say this with authority. How do you say it? How do you say in Hebrew, Holy Spirit? How do you say, bless the name of the Lord? Good. How do you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? Not very tight. <laughs> Bless the name of the Lord is Baruch Hashem Adonai. The blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord is Baruch Abba B'Shem Adonai. How do you say our Father, our King? Some of you got it. How do you say, I'll give you a little help with this one. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob begins with the word Elohe. Abraham, Abraham. How do you say in Hebrew, Sabbath peace? Shabbat. Turn to the person next to you and say Shabbat. Okay, how do you say in Hebrew, Hashem? How do you say in Hebrew, Prince of Peace? How do you say in Hebrew, El Shaddai? El Shaddai. How do you say in Hebrew, Jerusalem? Jerusalem. How do you say in Hebrew, Kadosh? Kadosh. <laughs> Very good. Give yourselves a hand. You sound so Jewish. Sounds so Jewish. So now, as we saw in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 9, as God restores us to a pure language, that in a greater capacity we're going to be able to call upon the name of the Lord together and to serve Him in one accord. It's a picture of unity. And you know, we've all have, uh, heard that expression, you know, he and I speak the same language, or she and I speak the same language. I'm glad that uh, 
Dr. Bridges and Dr. Daniels is here today because, you know, we speak the same language, mainly through corny jokes. <laughs> Very important for a good rabbi-doctor relationship. <laughs> but anyway, it's similar to that. If we all have some knowledge of Ivrit, of the Hebrew, we're going to be speaking the same language. It means greater communication in the natural and in the spirit. Again, another question, how many of you love God's Word? And one step further, how many of you love the hidden manna of God's Word? How many of you are hungry today for the hidden manna of God's Word? I believe you're going to get some. Because we're going to look closely at the ancient Hebrew language where each Hebrew letter was literally a picture of what that letter meant, a picture of what the actual letter meant, which reveals a deeper hidden meaning when these letters come together to form Hebrew words. And we'll start simply by looking at the first few letters of the ancient Hebrew Aleph Bet, and then we'll also make some comparison with those letters and the same letters that are used in today's modern Hebrew. And once again, I want to thank uh, Ann, my secretary, for helping me to prepare this PowerPoint presentation and for Paul for displaying it. So let's begin by looking at the first letter, Aleph. And there you can see on the bottom, that's the ancient Hebrew. That's actually a pictogram, the picture of the head of an ox. There's the modern Hebrew for Aleph. And Aleph actually means an ox. It symbolizes strength, a leader, what comes first. And Aleph is actually a derivative of the word aluf, which means gentle or tame. So together, the Aleph, the first letter in the Hebrew Aleph Bet, represents a leader who is strong, yet gentle and tame, which is also a description of the nature of an ox. And it can be applied to others who have the same qualities as we saw earlier in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9, meaning people serving the Lord like oxen pulling the yoke together, shoulder to shoulder. What's also of interest is that the letter Aleph is a universal symbol for the name of God or for God, and we also are created in the image of God. It adds to the unity of pulling the yoke together like oxen as children of God. Now the second letter in the Hebrew Aleph Bet is the letter Bait. And there you can see it is originally the floor plan of a house. There's the modern bait. <coughs> and it represents a household or a family. And the letter bait, this letter is actually the very first letter in the Torah as in the word breshit, which means in the beginning, meaning that once you start reading the Torah, it's God's way of saying, welcome home. You've just stepped into my house. Now, there is a word bayit, which is a derivative of bait, and it also means a house, a place, or a family. Now we have these two letters, so let's begin to form Hebrew word pictures by joining these two letters together. If you can find the next overhead. And there you will see that when the Aleph and the Beit, there it is in the modern Hebrew, the Aleph and the Beit are brought together. They form the word Abba. Everybody say Abba. Abba, Abba which is in the a very affectionate term for father, more specifically, daddy. And we know that Paul adds in Romans 8, verse 15, it's by the spirit of adoption that we cry out, Abba, 
Father. Somebody say, Abba, Father, I love you. Abba, Father, I love you. And Abba is indeed a loving father who is a strong leader of a household, yet gentle and loving. Now, a similar Hebrew word for father is the Hebrew word av, if we can find that one. And this is just in the modern Hebrew. It uses the aleph and the vate. The aleph and the vate. Similar to the letters for Abba, using the aleph and the vate. And by the way, the vate is the same letter as the vate. There's just no dot in the middle. That's what separates the two. Still again, Av represents a strong yet gentle leader of a household or a family. Now the Hebrew word for love is Ahav, and in light of that, Ahava, really good message for you today. <laughs> the Hebrew word for love is Ahav, which uses, if we can find the next PowerPoint, it uses the Aleph, the He, and the Vate. Ahav, the He, and and the vate. And also, the letter He, you can see, is between the olive and the vate. And the ancient pictograph of the He, or the pictogram, there you can see, is a man holding his hands up in the air, ready to receive or to behold divine truth. And the letter He actually means behold. One of the reasons why at the beginning of the service today I had you lift up your hands in the spirit, meaning that you're ready to receive something from God today. Hallelujah. Amen. So perhaps now when we put all these letters together we have a greater revelation of what it says or what it means in 1 John chapter 3 verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Now this is also connected with the ancient Hebrew pictograph of the word Yara, if we can find the next PowerPoint. And Yara, we should know by now, is the root Hebrew word for Torah. And Yara uses the three Hebrew letters, the Yud, the Resh, and the He. Yud, Resh, He. And the pictograph for a Yud is a hand. The pictograph for the Resh is a head. And again, for the He is someone ready to receive divine truth. Putting all three together, Yara, again, which is the root for Torah, means to receive or behold correct instruction that comes from the hand of one who is the head of the family. Or in other words, loving instruction from a father to his children. That is so important. The Torah is not, does not just mean law. And when somebody says to you, why are you putting yourself under the law? You can correct them. No, I'm not putting myself under the law. I am putting myself under loving instruction for my father to his children. Amen. Big difference. Now, let's look at the next PowerPoint because it is the last letter of the Hebrew Aleph Beit, and it is the letter Tav. And as you can see, the ancient pictogram is actually a picture of a cross. And it means a mark or a sign, and there is the modern um, form of the Tav. Again, the ancient Tav is in the shape of a cross. It means a mark or a sign, and it symbolizes the sealing of a covenant. And this is why Yeshua said, I am the Aleph. Remember the Aleph represents the ox or a strong leader. Why Yeshua said, I am the Aleph and the Tav, because he is a strong leader who sealed the Brit Hadashah, the new covenant, with the sign of the cross. In reality, the cross is not just a Christian symbol, but really an ancient Jewish symbol. The cross is an ancient Jewish 
symbol. Think about it. It's also the place where the king of the Jews gave his life for you and for me. Now we know that Satan has tried to pervert the cross through a spirit of anti-Semitism. During the Crusades, the Inquisition and the Shoah, meaning the Holocaust, Christian soldiers held their crosses up high as they raped and as they plundered and as they murdered the Jewish people. We know that even Hitler said, everything I do, I do in the name of the Holy Catholic Church. So Satan has tried to pervert the cross, just like Satan has tried to pervert the Star of David, the Magad David. We know this is true because the Druids, who were the priests of Celtic nations, they used the hexagram as a magical charm. And we know that in Nazi Germany, the Jewish people were forced to wear the yellow star of David as a badge of shame. So Satan has tried to pervert these ancient emblems, but God, somebody say, but God. But God is restoring his people to a pure language. And how many of you know that God can take what the enemy means for evil and turn it around for good and turn it around for his glory? Hallelujah. If you believe that, give him a great big clap. Amen. Okay, let's keep moving on. Let's find the next PowerPoint, which is the letter, the Hebrew letter, Dalit. And it actually means a door. And as you take a closer look at that ancient pictogram, you'll see that this letter is so old that it's the original picture, that the original picture is out of a hide of skin that is like hanging down, emphasis on hanging down which actually is what was used for an ancient door. And the Hebrew word delet, which is a derivative of dalet, means the leaf of a gate, a door, or even a page. So the pictograph symbolizes again a door, or a path, or a way of life, a way in which to go, a door to go through, referred to by the rabbis as halakha. Now let's form a Hebrew word picture using the Dalit and the Tav. The Hebrew word for religion is pronounced Dat, D-A-T, everybody say Dat. Dat. And it uses the Dalit and the Tav. And again, the Dalit symbolizes the door or a path or the way of life, a way in which to go. The Tav symbolizes a mark or a sign which leads to the sealing of a covenant. Having said that, let's turn please to the Gospel of John, chapter 10. John chapter 10, let's begin with verse 7. Then Yeshua said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Yeshua also says in John chapter 14 verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So true religion, according to the ancient Hebrew for the word dot, reveals that the door to eternal life comes through the cross, or in other words, the Dalit, which leads to the Tav. Also of interest, Hashem told the Israelites to put the blood of the Lamb where? 
during the Exodus story on the doorposts of their homes in Exodus 12. Whoever was inside the home where the blood was applied on the doorpost was safe, pointed toward Yeshua, the blood of Yeshua, our Passover lamb. Now if you can stretch your imagination a little bit, in ancient Israel, the blood-stained door was also a picture or an image of what happened on the tree of sacrifice, on the cross, on the top. Because the blood on the top of the door, the blood on the two side posts, and then again at the basin at the bottom where the Passover lamb was slain, if you can picture that, it formed a cross. And it pointed toward the blood of the lamb which flowed from Yeshua's head, from a crown of thorns, from his extended hands, and from his feet, which were pierced by the Roman spikes. And all of this as he hung on the tree of sacrifice. He hung on the cross as the door that leads to the sealing of a covenant. The dala leads to the tab. And this is all revealed to us through the ancient Hebrew Aleph Beit. Now let's take a closer look at the word Breshit, again, which is the first word in the Bible. And this is a little more sophisticated. There you can see the word Breshit and reading from right to left. It uses the Beit, the Resh, the Aleph, the Shin, the Yud, and the Tav. Six letters in all. Three of them with, is the Beit, the Yud, and the Tav, or the first, the fifth and the sixth letters form the word bait, which means a house. The second, third, and fourth letters in the middle form the Hebrew word rosh, which means head, as in the word rosh hashanah, which means the head of the year. Notice also as we look that that the word head is in the middle of the house. Hallelujah. Right in the middle of the house. Who is the head of the house? We know that God is. But let's also look at some other scriptures in the New Covenant. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to look at a few scriptures here, verse 15, Paul writes, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Messiah. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1, a few pages forward, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the ecclesia, the assembly who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness, fullness should dwell. One more, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. 
Somebody say, Yeshua is the head of the house. Amen. Now let's look, that was the word Breshit, the first word. Now let's look at the second Hebrew word in Genesis 1.1, and that is the word Bara. And there you can see that it consists of the three Hebrew letters, the Beit, the Resh, and the Aleph. Bara. And the word Bara means to create something from nothing. To create something from nothing. This word is only used in referring to God's ability to create, but never in man's ability to create. Man makes or forms things already created, or uses things that were already created, but only God create, can create something from nothing, meaning that he can just speak it forth. He can just speak it into existence, like you and me. Therefore, bara has a definite connection with, in a divine sense, or with divinity. Now within the word bara is another biblical word that we're familiar with, and that is, using the bait and the resh, the word bar. And the word bar is actually an Aramaic word, and it means son of. It is equivalent to the Hebrew word ben, which means son of, like Yeshua, ben David, and so on. But examples where bar would be used is in bar Timaeus, which means son of Timaeus, or bar Jonah, son of Jonah, or bar mitzvah, son of the commandment. And so in sense of the divinity, that's connected with or applied to the word bara in Genesis 1.1, if we can find the next PowerPoint, if we separate the olive, which was part of the word bara, if we separate the olive from the first two letters, the bait and the resh, we get the phrase Bar, son of Aleph. And again, the Aleph is the first letter of the Aleph Bait. It is the letter that represents God. So the two words put together literally reads the son of Aleph or Yeshua, the son of God. Add to this the word Ruach. Everybody say Ruach. Ruach. Which means the spirit of God that's in verse 2. Here in the first two verses of the Torah, we see the triune nature of God. Now furthermore, if we could find the next PowerPoint, this again is Breshit Bara, first two words in the Bible. And the first three letters of both of these words use the Beit, the Resh, and the Aleph. Beit, Resh, Aleph which is an acronym for Ben, Ruach, Av, which means Son, Spirit, and Father. The triune nature of God in the first two words of the Bible. Now the third word in Genesis 1-1 is Elohim, as in Breshit bara Elohim. And it is a plural noun, Elohim, for describing God. It speaks of one God, not three. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Hero Israel. The Lord our God is one God. But perhaps the mystery of God's plurality will be revealed to us when we are in heaven. But another scripture that captures it nicely, meaning the triune nature, in connection with Genesis 1-1 is Isaiah chapter 48. Verse 16, let's begin to turn there. Isaiah chapter 48. Verse 16, this is a scripture that we looked at in last week's teaching.
Come near to me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. That actually is a repeat of Genesis 1 verse 1, which uses Ben, Ruach, and Ab, Son, Spirit, and Father, all in one passage of Scripture. So again, Yeshua, He is the Aleph and the Tav. He is also the Son of Aleph, which we saw earlier. But He also said, I and the Father are one. To have seen me is to have seen the Father. In Revelation chapter 1, you don't have to turn there, Revelation 1, verse 8 and 11, Yeshua, again, who is the Word of God, He refers to Himself as the Aleph and the Tav, or in the Greek, Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And Isaiah, we're still in Isaiah 48, verse 12 and 13, ties this together with Yeshua's involvement in the creation of the world. Let's read verse 12 and 13. Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel my called. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4, a great scripture in witnessing to Jewish people. It reads, Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? Tell me if you know. And then in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, it adds, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things that were made were made through Him. Again, it all connects from Genesis to Isaiah to the Gospel of John to the book of Revelation. The more you read the Bible, the whole Bible, the more you see Yeshua in it from the beginning to the end because He is the Word. Hallelujah. Now let's remember that Yeshua, the Aleph and the Tav, is also the light of the world in Hebrew or HaVolam. And if we can find the next PowerPoint, if you place the seven words of the first sentence of the Torah, it looks like this. Breshit bara Elohim et, using the Aleph and the top, Hashemayim et Haaretz, translated in English, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And notice again that the word et, the Aleph and the top, it appears at the very top and center of the menorah representing Yeshua, who is the light of the world. You might be thinking, why is he at the top and the center of the menorah? Remember again that in Colossians 1.19 and Colossians 2.9, it says that for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, and that God has made him the head of the house. Now notice also that the Aleph and the Tav of the word et is right beside the word Elohim. If you can find that same PowerPoint again. Not the one before. That's it. The third word from the right is Elohim. And then here is the Aleph and the Tav. And so from using the proper perspective, not you looking at it this way, but the proper perspective would be this way. We see that the Aleph and the Tav is at the right side of Elohim, representing Yeshua, who is at the right hand of God. Hallelujah. Now, most of us here today, I'm sure, if not all of us, are believers in the Messiah. How many of you are believers in Yeshua? Raise your hand. Hallelujah. We know that He is the Messiah. We know He's the Aleph and the Tav. We know that He is the light of the world. We know that He is the Word of God. We know that He is the door. But many of our Jewish people, they, they do not. Not yet. Somebody say, not yet. Not yet. But one day, they will. Everyone, but one day, 
they will. Let's look at one last scripture in the prophet Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look upon me, underline the word me, whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Now I'd like to show you how this verse of scripture reads in the original Hebrew. And there you could see, highlighted and underlined, the word in connection for me, as they will look upon me, is the Aleph and the Tav. The one they're going to look upon is Yeshua, the only Son of God. And in that day, they will cry out, Baruch Haba, B'Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Long before his crucifixion, Yeshua, the Aleph and the Tav, was the Lamb of God slain since the foundation of the world. And one day the Jewish people will see it, and not only that, but they will believe it. Paul adds in Romans 11, the Deliverer will come from Zion, and all Israel shall be saved. Hallelujah. If you believe that, give the Lord a great big clap off for right now. The Deliverer will come from Zion, and all Israel shall be saved. Hallelujah. I feel an anointing coming on. Let's begin to stand. Hallelujah. The Deliverer will come from Zion, and all Israel shall be saved. For God has exalted him to the highest place, that at the name of Yeshua, every knee in heaven, Every knee in the earth, every knee below the earth is going to bow down. And every tongue in heaven, every tongue in the earth, and every tongue below the earth is going to confess, whether they want to or not, that Yeshua is Lord of all to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. He is the King of Israel. He is the King of Jerusalem. He is the King of glory. He is the King of heaven and earth. He is the King of the universe. He is the king of all kings, and the king is coming back soon, and he's going to rule and he's going to reign the whole earth from Jerusalem, hallelujah. And again, all the nations will come up and worship the king during the Feast of Sukkot. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yeshua is the king. Kings will come. Kings will go. Rulers will come, rulers will go, presidents will come, presidents will go, prime ministers will come, prime ministers will go. But there is one king who remains king forever and ever and ever, and his kingdom endures for all eternity, and his kingdom surely will swallow up all the kingdoms of the earth. His name is Yeshua, his name is Yeshua, his name is Yeshua. And if you believe it, give the Lord a great big clap offering. And let's give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Praise the King. It was the Aleph and the Tom, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So in conclusion here, as you can see, the Hebrew language brings out much of the hidden matter of the Bible. It begins with learning the basics of Hebrew, meaning the letters, how to pronounce them, how to read them, how to write them, and also learning the vowel points that go with them. Classes begin July the 12th. Pastor Clint's not here today, he's out of town, but he'll be teaching the class. He's an excellent teacher. The sign-up sheet is in the foyer. Once again, if you're interested, sign up. We need your names now. And let's remember, again, I want to ask you, how many of you love God's Word? It's God's Word that endures forever. God's Word that is forever settled in heaven. And the more you read the Bible, the more you see Yeshua 
in it. Somebody say it's all about Yeshua. Hallelujah. But let's give him one more great big clap. Amen. Amen. Let's have the worship team come back up and conclude by singing one last song. And as we sing this song, if you're here today and you want deeper revelation of the Word of God, if you want more of the Spirit in your life, and more of that hidden manna of the Word of God, come forward and we'll anoint you with oil.
May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, perfect peace. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach, the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. And altogether, that thy way may be known upon the earth and thy salvation among all nations. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. We've had a wonderful service. Let's give Hashem another great big clap. God bless you. We are dismissed from the sanctuary. Let's go downstairs for food and fellowship. And again, Shabbat Shalom.